Good morning, everyone. My guest today is Professor Randall Balmer. And I'm very delighted to have Professor Balmer. Uh, he wrote a book entitled uh, Bad Faith. It's a very interesting book. Um, anxious to get in and, and look at what he says about uh, the issue of religion in America today, particularly uh, evangelical Christians and the movement that started uh, arguably the newest wave of that movement to start it arguably in the late 70s on into the 80s. Um, so uh, welcome, uh, Professor uh, Balmer. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. And we are delighted that you have stopped by and taken the time. We know that your time is very important and uh, certainly you have a lot on your plate. So let's just start at the beginning uh, so we can introduce um, you to, to those who are watching uh, this conversation. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Where were you born? I was born in Chicago while my father was a student at a place called Trinity Seminary and Bible College on the north side of Chicago, preparing for the ministry. So um, my, my growing up years were... Uh, spent in various parsonages across the, the Midwest as he went from place to place uh, uh, for his job uh, okay. as, a, as a pastor. Wonderful. In fact, you've answered the next question. So at some point, your father became a pastor after he graduated. Um, what was the first place you recall your father pastoring? Well, he was uh, did an interim pastor in uh, Nebraska, which is where he grew up in, in southeastern Nebraska. But uh, the first place I really remember is uh, rural southern Minnesota, uh, mm -hmm. the far suburbs of Fairmont, Minnesota, in a place called East Chain, uh, literally, and I'm not, I, I use the term literally, literally, uh, literally surrounded by cornfields and farms. We were way out in the country, and uh, that's where we spent the, the first few years of, uh, of his career. And then on to uh, Bay City, Michigan. And then from there to Des Moines, Iowa, which is where I spent my high school years. Okay. And what religious tradition was your father? My father was a pastor for 40 years in the Evangelical Free Church of America. And in fact, he concluded his ministry by being a district superintendent in Central California. Okay. So he had a long and very productive career. And uh, as I said very often, I, I honor both his ministry and his memory. Tell us just a little bit about um, that particular faith tradition, the, the central core beliefs. Well, uh, the Evangelical Free Church is kind of mainline uh, evangelical. In fact, I've people have asked me for uh, my definition of evangelical, and I have a I have a, a definition for it. But I often think of it as my father. I mean, he was mm -hmm. my father was a was a. a a uh, very ironic uh, individual, uh, a very gentle man in many ways. Uh, he was not uh, not a, a, a barnstorming preacher by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, he believed very much in uh, the Bible as God's revelation to humanity. He believed in the importance of a conversion or born again experience as mm -hmm. Uh, the way we enter the uh, the kingdom of heaven, and he was also very concerned about evangelism. He wanted to to bring others into the into the faith, and uh, I remember that he would always have a copy of the four spiritual laws in his uh, shirt pocket, mm -hmm. and whenever he had an opportunity to to share his faith with others, whether on a, a plane trip or uh, simply in a restaurant or coffee shop, uh, he he took advantage of that opportunity. Yes, and I'm I'm quite familiar with that approach as well. However, today when when many people hear the term evangelical, there's something else that comes to mind, particularly in the context of America's political um, yeah. div divisiveness. Yeah. Now, when you speak about evangelicalism, what I hear is someone who was concerned about spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ and seeing the kingdom of God expand. And so is that the sense in which you refer to your father as an evangelical? Oh, absolutely. He was very much concerned uh, with that. And in fact, and, and this is this is true more broadly of, of white evangelicals, and I do want to emphasize white as the, as the adjective here. Uh, in the middle decades of the 20th century, when I was growing up, uh, they were 
absolutely apolitical. Uh, many not even registered to vote in the middle decades of the of the 20th century, by which I mean the, the 50s and 60s and even into the 1970s. And my father was very much part of that. Now he did vote. I mean, he was, uh, you know, he, he didn't neglect that. He saw that as, as part of his civic responsibility, but that very much was secondary to him, to the importance of, uh, of sharing the gospel. And I remember many times uh, he would, uh, not many times, but uh, occasionally uh, he would be praying uh, and and he was concerned about those he would describe as the lost, meaning those who are without Jesus. And and he would uh, he would break into tears uh, over that. I mean, he was a, a person of utterly sincere faith. But at the same time, getting back to your question, uh, um, uh, apolitical in, in terms, he, he would never uh, preach a political sermon from the pulpit, for example. Uh, that would just, for, for him, that would be, uh, that would be anathema. That would be uh, a waste of an opportunity for him. Preaching was uh, trying to bring people into a closer relationship with Jesus. And he was very much concerned about that. And, you know, I'm glad that you touched on that. And we'll go into that further um, because you're now talking about at some point in America's past, uh, evangelicals were very involved in trying to help uh, the people who were on the margin of society. Absolutely. Then something happened, and we'll talk about that in, in just a moment. Uh, but specifically, what I found interesting in your book also re relative to that was the conversation about uh, post millennial post millennial in I'll get it out post millennialism yes, versus right. pre millennialism yes, right okay right um so since we are there why don't we just go ahead and talk <laughs> about how those two approaches sure. and those two ideas about the coming of Christ's kingdom impacted evangelicals right. involvement in politics in the past and yeah. in the present and, and I'll try to do so without getting too much into the weeds because it can get <laughs> get rather uh, turgid uh, theologically if we do that. But um, what happened with with evangelicalism in the in the 19th century, that is before the Civil War, uh, evangelicals were very much motivated by what is known theologically as post millennialism. And again, I don't want to get too technical here, but uh, anybody who is post millennialist believes that Jesus will return to earth after his followers create the millennial kingdom here on earth. Now, as you know, uh, the term millennium comes from the book of Revelation, and it refers to 1,000 years of righteousness uh, and, and prosperity here, in, uh, here, on, here on earth. Uh, this is a time when, when, when Jesus rules. Now, the, the question has always been in terms of interpretation, when is that millennium going to take place? And so in the early part of the 19th century, evangelicals like Charles Finney, for example, who by any measure was the most important uh, evangelical of the 19th century, Charles Finney and others believed that the millennium, that Jesus would return to earth after the millennial kingdom had been established. And so what that happened, what that does is it, it energizes and animates all these social reform movements that become characteristic of evangelicalism in the 19th century. The move for the abolition of slavery, obviously in the North, not in the South, because Southern evangelicals did, did support slavery. Prison reform. Uh, the the push for women's equality, including voting rights, which was considered a radical idea in the 19th century, the uh, various peace movements that were generated in the early part of the 19th century. I've even run across a, a reference to an evangelical organization dedicated to gun control in the 19th century. Yeah. And again, all of this was uh, an attempt to say, we want to create the kingdom of God on earth. We want to reform society according to the norms of godliness. Uh, another very important element of their uh, agenda was public education, uh, known as common schools in the 19th century. And this was a way that evangelicals recognized. This was a way that evangelicals could, and, and others, could uh, 
make those on the bottom rungs of society upwardly mobile so they could join uh, the middle class and, and have their 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 fortunes advanced because of getting an education. So all of this was part of the agenda. And again, it was animated by the conviction that we as, as Christians, as believers, as evangelicals, we are responsible for creating this millennial kingdom here on earth. What happens, and again, I'm happy to get into more detail if you want. On this. No, you're doing fine and at, at that level. Um, thank you. That was a great summary. So, so what happened? Let's go to that. What happened? Exactly. What happened over the course of the 19th century is that social and historical circ circumstances began to cast doubt on premillennialism, on, on postmillennialism. Uh, I think beginning with the Civil War, I, I always kind of trace it to that. And, and you know very well the carnage of the Civil War. Uh, historians now estimate that the casualties of the Civil War during the Civil War were 750,000. That's, three, that's three quarters of a million casualties during the Civil War. And so we had these battlefields where, you know, they had these soldiers laid out and, you know, just you know, for acres, it seems, uh, because of the Civil War. More important, toward the end of the 19th century, you had the influx of non-Protestant immigrants, Jews, Catholics, most of whom did not share evangelical Protestant scrupulous, uh, scrupulous, scruples about temperance. And so you had evangelicals by, say, 1880, certainly by 1890, looking at the Lower East Side of Manhattan and these squalid, teeming settlements, um, or tenements rather, uh, roiling with labor unrest. And they began to say, wait a minute, we thought we were constructing this millennial kingdom, the kingdom of God on earth, but look what was happening in this in the society. We must have gotten it wrong. And so into that context comes... Uh, uh, again, I don't want to get too much into detail here, but uh, comes a, a, a an Irish theologian named named Charles Darson, uh, Charles Nelson Darby, and Darby said to American evangelicals, he said, "Look, you guys have been reading the Bible all wrong. Jesus is not going to come back after you." construct this millennial millennial kingdom. Jesus is going to come back at any time. And this is called pre-millennialism. Again, to use... No, use that, that's very important. Yeah. So, very important. And if you think about pre-millennialism, this notion that Jesus is going to come back at any moment, what does that do to your social reform agenda? And what it happens is that evangelicals, by the turn of the 20th century, even as early as 1890 and, and before, begin to say, why bother? If Jesus is coming back at any moment, all we can do is concentrate on individual conversions rather than social reform. Now, I like to joke <laughs> about this, and maybe this isn't appropriate, but I'll do it anyway. Uh, so... Uh, the adoption of premillennialism, and again, this is white evangelicalism, and I want to be clear about that. The adoption of premillennialism essentially absolved evangelicals from the task of social reform, of making this world a better place. It's also responsible for some colossally bad architecture. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. If Jesus is coming back at any moment, cinder block will do just fine. <laughs> you have this kind of right. Bible camp uh, uh, architecture that uh, characterizes evangelicalism for much of the 20th century. So uh, again, to kind of get circle back to your our, our early earlier conversation and, and your question about my father, my father was de very definitely a premillennialist. Mm -hmm. That is, he believed that Jesus was coming back at any point. And I'll even embroider that point uh, further by saying that uh, perhaps you and maybe some of your uh, your your listeners here uh, are aware of a, a, a kind of a campy movie called A Thief in the Night, Absolutely. which was a 
a, a, a cinematic um, demonstration of premillennialism. That is, the, Jesus came, comes back in the course of this film, and the true believers are are are, are lifted into heaven, mm -hmm. and then all sorts of terrible judgment. The rapture. The, the rapture. the rapture. The rapture. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Again. Right. Yeah, got it. So, I mean, you're familiar with that film, I, I take it. I've seen the film and I'm familiar with everything you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Well, uh, the director of that film was my Sunday school teacher. That film was inspired by my father's Sunday evening sermons on the book of Revelation. And my father plays the so-called good preacher in that film. So I, I mentioned that. So you're, you're famous, actually. I'm sorry? You actually are a famous guy yourself. <laughs> well, at one remove. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, but I, I mentioned that just to say that my father was a premillennialist. He believed Jesus was coming. I mean, he, he, I mean, he believed that to his bones, mm -hmm. that Jesus would return at any, any moment. And by the way, he was, he was not alone. Billy Graham, I, I, did a, I did a PBS documentary about Billy Graham. Uh, in the early 1990s. And uh, one of my questions for him when I interviewed him was uh, how, uh, how he thought that historians would remember him. And his immediate answer was, I don't think they'll pay any attention to me because Jesus is gonna come back uh, before I die. And, and you know that was just a fairly common um, uh, understanding among evangelicals. Now, again, I'm sorry for the long answer, but this gets us back to yeah. our, our larger narrative here. And that is to say that uh, th through the 1950s, through the 1960s, and well into the 1970s, evangelicals, largely, again, white evangelicals, were premillennialists. And so mm -hmm. they, that accounts for their lack of interest in politics. Uh, because again, Jesus is coming back at any time. Let's not worry too much about the uh, the temporal order, about what's happening here and now, because we have our eyes focused on uh, mm -hmm. on what's ahead, and that changes dramatically uh, in in the nineteen seventies. And that mm -hmm. I think is where we're headed with this conversation. But yes, I'll let and, you take over. <laughs> yeah, no, th that was a great background. I just think that most Christians today, and certainly most people, most Americans, do not know that history. And then we're going to move forward and we're going to talk about how uh, the evangelicals, the white Christian evangelicals become re-engaged in society. What's the triggering point? Um, I'm just going to throw this out here as a, as a, as a, a prelude to coming attractions. Uh, the myth of abortion, you discussed sure. that in right. this book extensively. And we, we're going to talk about that because I think it's very important for people to know that is a major issue today, right? Is. I mean, uh, is. abortion is driving the political conversation in the United States of America today. How did it become so central yeah. um, to our conversations, to our expressions of faith? Right. We'll, we'll talk about that in just a moment. But, you know, I, I would be remiss if I didn't give uh, the audience a little bit more background about yourself in terms of your professional training. So you grew up in, in different parts of the Midwest. Where did you go to college? I went to a college, uh, my denomination's uh, college, uh, which was the Trinity College in Deerfield, Illinois, which sadly just closed last year. It's, it's, it's a real tragedy because it was a very important place for me. I, um, I, I had, I got a very good education there, I think. And then I, I stayed on the same campus and worked at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, which is, again, the same campus. And then while I was working there for three years, I did a master's degree in church history at Trinity Divinity School. And then in 1980, I went to Princeton University, where I earned the, the PhD um, from 1980 to 1985. And what is your, what area is your PhD? Uh, my field, um, generally is is American religious history. And uh, so actually I did most of my uh, graduate school training in the history department. I, I really came out of graduate school as a history, pardon me, a historian of colonial America. And then uh, I, I got my first job at uh, Columbia University where I stayed for 27 years. And what happened <laughs> uh, was in the late 1980s when I was just starting that, that job, 
uh, and I'm sure um, maybe you're too young for this, but uh, some some of your folks will remember in the late 1980s is when the, the televangelist scandals began to break with Jim and Tammy Faye Baker and uh, uh, Jimmy Swaggart and Oral Roberts, who declared that God had taken him hostage, essentially. And uh, for, eight, for eight million dollars, for eight million dollars. And yeah, we're taking I, I, home unless God's people ponied up the ransom. You know, I mean, and, and I have to say that I, I kind of. I found it kind of amusing. Mm -hmm. But what happened was that because I was in New York, uh, I started getting phone calls from ABC, NBC, and you know other media outlets to try to explain what was what was happening. Uh, and, and at that point, who are evangelicals? Um, nobody knew. I mean, uh, none, none, nobody in the media established knew who these people were. And so I was happy to do these interviews. And, and I, frankly, I kind of enjoyed it. And at the same time, I became rather impatient with the uh, assumption on the part of some of the media people. And it's not their fault. It's just that they didn't know better. The assumption that all evangelicals were either gullible uh, or the moral equivalent of Jim Baker and Jimmy Swagger. And having grown up in that world, I knew differently. I knew better. And so I, I devised this crazy idea, which became my second book, uh, that I would travel around the country and visit various groups of, of evangelicals uh, at the grassroots and uh, demonstrate the uh, write about them in a, in a kind of almost a journalistic way and demonstrate the internal diversity of this movement. So I went to a fundamentalist Bible camp in the Adirondacks. I went to um, um, an African-American uh, evangelical organization down in Mississippi that had been started by um, um, John Perkins. I went to a Dallas Theological Seminary. I went to uh, an old fashioned camp meeting in St. Petersburg, Florida. I went to uh, Indian Reservation in North Dakota and so forth. I mean, you know, a lot of different places. So that's yeah. what kind of got me moving in the direction with my scholarship toward a study of, of evangelicalism, which of course I knew well because I grew up within that within that world. So I I, I was I already spoke the language, so to speak. I knew and, and so because we're there, and I think it's very important, um, what was the name of that book mm -hmm. in the in the event that we want to look into this topic further? Yeah, uh, the, the book was called Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory. And it's actually now in its fifth edition. Uh, the subtitle, A Journey into the Evangelical Subculture in America. And, and where can we get that? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Where can we get that book? Um, we're interested. Anywhere. I mean, it's it's widely available. Okay, uh, widely and, available. And, and actually then uh, uh, we, we made that book into a three-part series for PBS. And, uh, and, you know, if I can be immodest for a moment, <laughs> please. Uh, I was uh, I was nominated for an Emmy for uh, writing and and hosting that series. So uh, that book, that and that book uh, again kind of uh, reoriented my scholarship away from colonial America. Although I still I still you know love colonial history, but uh, I've been writing about evangelicalism um, pretty much ever since. That's, that's a wonderful story. And presently, are you a professor of religious history at any particular institution? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm at Dartmouth College. I was at uh, Columbia University for 27 years. And then in uh, 2012, I moved to, to Dartmouth College. And I've been there ever since. Great. Now, let's get to the main event. <laughs> Your book, Bad Faith. Can you tell us what prompted you to write this book? Well, in, in many ways, the book is a culmination of, of many years of research, uh, to be honest. Um, and I, I mentioned in my, my college and my, my divinity school training was at Trinity College in Deerfield, Illinois. Again, uh, and, and Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. So these are the schools associated with the Evangelical Free Church, which is the, the denomination in which I was reared. And so I spent the 1970s, I started college in the fall of 1972, and I left for graduate school in the summer of 1980. So I spent the 1970s really 
hunkered into what I have come to call the evangelical subculture here in, in America. And when I began to hear uh, in the 1980s that evangelicals were all, um, they, were, they, were, they became uh, fixated with the issue of abortion, I kind of scratched my head and said, well, where did this come from? I, I simply don't remember this being a topic of, of conversation in the 1970s. Again, when I was, I was immersed in, in this world, uh, this, this evangelical subculture. So that you know, kind of got me started uh, on, on thinking about this. Um, and, and I'm going to come back to your question. You know, the immediate catalyst for the book actually was in 2014, uh, Politico asked me to write an article about the origins of the religious right. And so I did. And, and by that time, I had been doing a lot of research on it. And I, I'd been talking about it in various places. So I, I mean, I kind of fired off this article, frankly, rather quickly. And ever since that article appeared, I keep getting phone calls and emails and queries about this. And I didn't know this history. I didn't know the, the real history of how this political movement got going. And so, you know, finally I decided, well, uh, I'd done more research since writing that article in 2014. And also that article didn't allow me to put in footnotes so people could check my sources. So I, I went to Erdman's public publishing company and I said, any chance you guys are interested in this book? And so uh, I, I wrote uh, Bad Faith, Race and the Rise of the Religious Right. And so that's the, the immediate okay. um, prompting for that book. For that book. Excellent. Now let's talk about a, a meeting yeah. conference that happened yeah. in 1990 in yeah. Washington, D.C. What can you tell us about that? That it, It's, you know, I, I'm, I'm a believer, as you know, and so yeah. I have to say that uh, I, I do believe in divine providence. Uh, I, I don't I don't go all in for the whole Calvinist agenda, but I do, I do believe in divine providence. That is, I believe that 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 um, God um, orders our lives in, in ways that we we don't fully appreciate or understand at the time. Well, right. in this case, uh, this was uh, 1990, and I was invited to a, a conference in Washington, D.C. And uh, at that time, I, I was not yet tenured, uh, or was I? No, I, I wasn't yet tenured at, at Columbia. I had a young family. And so I, as, as the date grew closer, I, I said, well, am I really going to go to this or not? I'm not sure what this is all about. And so I, I, I went back and forth. Finally, I decided, yeah, I'm going to go. So I come to Washington, D.C., and I find myself in a conference room with a kind of who's who of the religious right. Ralph Reed was there. Uh, the and that's Ralph Reed of the Christian Coalition. Christian Coalition. Uh, Donald Wildman, who had started a group, uh, organization called the American Family Association that did all these boycotts uh, of, of television programs because right. they, he regarded their their content as being, um, you know, pornographic or whatever, whatever it was. Anti-family. Um, yeah. Uh, Ralph Reed. I'm sorry. Um, uh, Richard Land of the Southern Baptist Convention was there. Uh, Ed Dobson, who had been one of Jerry Falwell's lieutenants at Moral Majority, was there. Um, Richard Vigory, the conservative direct mail guru, was there. Um, and Paul Weyrich, who really was the architect of the religious right. So I find myself in the room with these people, and I think, what am I doing here? <laughs> I, clearly, I didn't understand what was going on. I mean, these are not my people, to be honest. Um, <laughs> And and it turns out that the, the conference was really a 10 year celebration of the election of Ronald Reagan to the presidency. So it took place in November of 1990, looking back uh, over the, the previous decade. And I kept thinking to myself, I didn't celebrate 10 years ago. I'm not sure I want to celebrate today but anyway, not quite what you signed up for right it wasn't i i guess i probably didn't read i i, I probably didn't pay careful attention but, but nevertheless as you said yeah, i was there <laughs> divine providence now there was I, I, think, I think it was i think it was actually there was an interesting conversation you had with well one particular yeah the, in the first session that. the first session 
uh, actually George Marsden, my friend and colleague, um, and George, I think was at Duke uh, Divinity School at that time, uh, and, and later went on to, to Notre Dame. Uh, George Mar Marsden gave a paper, a very good paper, a good scholarly paper, and then there was a discussion afterwards. And in the course of the discussion, Paul Weirich, again, who's the architect of this movement, the religious right, made an impassioned statement. He said, let's remember that the, we didn't, we meaning evangelicals, did not become politically active in response to Roe v. Wade, in response to the abortion issue. And he was just, you know, really quite emphatic about this. And so uh, during the break after that session, I went up to him and I said, I want to make sure I understood you correctly. Abortion had nothing to do with this movement. He said, no, absolutely not. He said, I've been trying since the Goldwater campaign in 1964 to get these people, meaning white evangelicals, interested in politics. And I tried everything. He said, I tried the abortion issue. I tried the women's rights issue. I tried the school prayer issue, which of course in the 1960s was a big issue for a lot of folks. Uh, I tried, uh, I tried, uh, what else did you say? Uh, you mentioned prayer, in, prayer in school. Prayer in the schools, yeah, prayer. And then I think there was another one. Um, pornography, I think, was the other one. He, he said. Yeah. And yeah. he said, I, nothing got their attention. I couldn't get them organized politically until the 1970s when the Internal Revenue Service started to uh, challenge the tax exemption of racially segregated schools. He wow. said, that's what got us started. It had nothing to do with abortion. So I, whoa, I, you wow. know, and, and, and what, what, what was so compelling to me about that statement is that it, it, it made sense with my understanding and my, my recollection of the 1970s when abortion just wasn't, wasn't a topic of conversation. So let's, 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 let's um, park on Paul Weirich for a moment. Sure. Yep. Cause I think he's a central character. He is. Um, in this story. So let's talk more about who he is, who he was. Um, right. tell, tell us a little bit more about Paul Weirich uh, Paul and why we should be aware of who he was. Sure. And then, and then also talk about his relationship with uh, the late uh, Reverend Jerry Falwell. Right. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a crucial um, a tie. Yeah, Paul Weirich uh, was born, I believe, in Ripon, Wisconsin, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and he was a, a, a kind of uh, hard right, far right um, conservative and, and organizer. He was uh, the person who was responsible for uh, getting the Heritage Foundation uh, underway. Mm. Now, we're um, talking about just, uh, and I may interrupt you periodically sure. just because you're making a, you're at a very critical juncture that I think needs to be elaborated on. The Heritage Foundation, that particular entity has been in the news of late. Oh, yes. And, and uh, are we talking about the same Heritage Foundation that yes. were the drafters of Project 2025? Absolutely. Same oh. same organization. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. That that started that. He, he started that right. with with Joseph Coors money. And, you know, I have to say for somebody who grew up as a as a teetotaler, <laughs> the idea that the Joseph Coors is providing money for the religious right is something that I find a little you know, hard. It's, it's kind of like uh, during uh, prohibition or the run-up to prohibition, you had the uh, the mob that was funding uh, the speaking engagements of people. Some of the religious. This is my study now. You, you're the religious historian. Oh yeah, right. There was this unholy alliance. So politics uh, uh, makes yeah. sometimes strange bedfellows, but that yeah, that's sure. beside the point. Let's get back on and let's talk yeah. more about Paul. Yeah. So uh, Paul, Weirich, Paul Weirich was, um, um, you know, very, you know, uh, you know, died in the will conservative. There's no question about that, but he was a very good organizer. And so, and, and religiously he was, he was, I, 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 I should check this, but as I recall, the story is he, he, he was a Catholic and he, he grew disenchanted with the, the Roman Catholic Church after Vatican II. I believe that's the story. Don't hold me to that. And he joined some kind of really small recondite group called the Melkite Catholics or something like that, some kind of uh, very small group uh, because of his you know, religious convictions or scruples and so forth. But anyway... He's 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 a very very uh, good organizer. I refer to him as the evil genius in my book uh, because yes. I don't like what he 
eventually did. But he was the people. He was the person who was able to kind of pull this together. And again, coming back to the earlier your earlier question, the the impetus, the the catalyst had nothing to do with abortion. It had nothing to do with Roe v. Wade. And I expect we'll come back to that. And uh, is that why at certain points in the book you refer to the abortion myth? I talked about the abortion myth as the fiction that the religious right organized politically in response to the Roe v. Wade decision of January 22nd, 1973. It is absolute fiction. There's nothing, there's no evidence whatsoever for this. Um, uh, um, evangelicals considered abortion a Catholic issue throughout the 1970s. That's amazing. And, that is and amazing. Abortion has nothing to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, and, and if you want, I can go get, get into it a little no, bit. No, yeah. I, I do want you to get into the fact that there was uh, in 1971 a Southern Baptist convention and there yeah. was a resolution. Talk right. about that. Sure. That resolution on abortion. Sure. Yeah. Well, even before that, uh, in 1968, Christianity Today, which is kind of the flagship magazine for white evangelicalism, uh, uh, conducted a, a conference of, uh, of, of scholars, of, of evangelical theologians, uh, together with a group called the Christian Medical Society. And uh, as I remember, there were 26 evangelical theologians who gathered over several days to discuss the morality of abortion. At the end of their conference, they issued a statement saying, we can't, we can't agree whether or not abortion is morally wrong, but we think it should be available. Mm -hmm. Did they have some parameters that they set in terms of? Uh, I don't, I'd, I'd have to look at the statement again. Okay. It, was, it was a kind of an open-ended statement, but I mean, the, the gist of the statement was, you know, there's no consensus on this, uh, mm -hmm. on abortion. And, and if we're talking as evangelicals, we would say there's no biblical authority that we could point to. Well, that would be part of it. Yeah, that would wrong. be. That would be a big part of it, sure. I mean, you know, show me chapter and verse. Well, right, right. And they're saying they're and 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 in all candor, they're saying we can't point to a particular exactly. passage exactly in exactly. the Bible that says you do exactly. this, you're, you're going to hell. I mean, that's if we're going yeah. further into the weeds of evangelicalism, right? So that's important because I think most people who have some knowledge of, of the evangelicalism think that abortion was the primary and animating force behind the it is modern I mean, movement. And, and you 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 um, you you hit on it a little bit earlier in 1971 the Southern Baptist Convention is not exactly a stronghold of liberalism. No, not at all. Southern Baptist Convention meeting in St. Louis passed a resolution calling for the legalization of abortion, mm -hmm. which they reaffirmed in 1974, the year after Roe v. Wade. And again in 1976. Mm -hmm. So then, um, Professor, if if they had this position as recent as 1976, and I believe I read in your book where uh, the Reverend Jerry Falwell uh, didn't preach his first sermon against abortion until 1978, was there some type of uh, revelation, if I'm speaking in evangelical terminology, from yeah. God? Was there a prophetic word that came yeah. forward that said, you're missing this, you're out of bounds, you're out of <laughs> bounds, get back in bounds? What happened? It's a really good question. <laughs> um, I, what happens is that uh, this Paul Weirich, the guy that I that we talked about earlier, in advance of the 1978 midterm elections. Now, again, let's remember Weirich is this political organizer. Weirich went to the head of the Republican National Committee at that time, a man by the name of Bill Brock, who had, um, a former Republican senator from Tennessee. And Weirich asked Brock for some money to, to organize white evangelical voters. And according to Weirich, Brock looked across the desk at, at him at Weirich and said, are you crazy? I'm not going to give you money. Who are these people? I don't, I don't, I don't think this is a legitimate um, use for our money. Whereupon Weirich, again, according to his own account, uh, resolved to go out and elect some improbable people to the Senate in the 1978 midterm elections. He focuses on four Senate races. Uh, one is in New Hampshire, where Tom, the Democrat Thomas McIntyre was running for re-election. One is in Iowa, where the Democrat 
De Clark was running for re-election. And then two Senate races in uh, Minnesota. One of them was for the unexpired term of Walter Mondale, who, of course, was um, Jimmy Carter's vice president. And what happens in those Senate races, first of all, going into the into the election day, um, all of the polls, all the pundits said that these Democratic nominees or candidates were were going to win easily. And what happens is that on the Sunday before the midterm election in 1978, pro-lifers, Roman Catholics, because this is a Catholic issue until that time, leafleted church parking lots. And two days later, in an election with a very low turnout, which tends to be the case with midterm elections, all four of the favored Democratic candidates lost to anti-abortion Republicans. Now, wow. I, I remember going through Paul Weirich's papers, which are, oddly enough, at the University of Wyoming in Laramie, and coming across his, his correspondence surrounding that midterm election of 1978. And it's almost like the papers start to sizzle <laughs> because he realizes that he's finally found an issue that might engage grassroots white evangelicals. None of these other issues were working. Now, just... And, just uh, sorry to chime in, but when you say engage, I want to go back to the historical picture that you painted yep. before. Right. Once engage, now on the sidelines, right. but now here's the possibility for them to re-engage. Re-engage. But, right. you know, we missed a step here. And let's, okay, so, let's, and let's, let's, get, let's get all the steps in. <laughs> uh, this, this is my fault. Um, we talked about the abortion myth. The, again, the fiction that evangelicals became politically active in the 1970s in response to Roe v. Wade is simply not true. And again, I, you know, I don't want to bore your listeners no, or you. This is very uh, important. Going through all the issues, but I, I can I can say without fear of contradiction, <laughs> abortion was not the catalyst for mm -hmm. evangelical political activism in the 1970s. Okay, then what was? Let's get what to the was. what. And this is where we get into your your territory, yes. uh, um, that is court decisions and, and legal actions. The real catalyst was not Roe v. Wade. It was another court decision in a, in a decision that was handed down on June 30th, 1971 in a case called Green v. Connolly. Now, I'm, I am going to get into the weeds a little bit here because I think it's probably important. Yes. The background for Green v. Connolly was Holmes County, Mississippi, and the issue of desegregation of the public schools. The first year of desegregation in Holmes County, Mississippi, the number of white students in the public school system dropped from over 700, I think it was the number that keeps coming in my mind was uh, 771. Don't quote me on that number, but it's over 700. Over 700 white students in the public schools. The first year of publication of desegregation, that number of white students drops to 28. The second year of desegregation, that number drops to zero. So where do these children go? At the same time, three segregation academies, church sponsored, let's remember. And we're talking about God fearing, love Jesus, want to save the world. Absolutely. Okay. All white schools apply to the Internal Revenue Service for tax exempt status. Right. And a group of parents in Holmes County, Mississippi say, this isn't right. And so they file suit to block the tax exemption of these segregation academies. Now, again, I would defer to you about the whole legal history of this, but it gets that that suit gets tied up with another suit. It works its way through the court systems and it goes finally to the district court for the District of Columbia in a case called Green v. Connolly. Uh, Connolly was for John Connolly, who was the secretary of the treasurer secretary of the treasury and for that reason head of the internal revenue service right and on june 31st i'm sorry june 30th 1971 the district court for the district of columbia issued a, uh, a ruling that said that in effect 
any organization that engages in racial segregation or racial discrimination is not by definition a charitable institution. And therefore it has no claims on tax exempt status. And that's a blockbuster decision. That's why? a blockbuster decision. Tell, tell us why that was blockbuster. Well, what happens then is that, well, first of all, Richard Nixon, who's president at the time, uh, issues a, a, a director of the Internal Revenue Service saying, don't issue tax exemption uh, exemptions to any segregation academies. So it's Nixon really behind it. And then what happens over the course of the 1970s is that the Internal Revenue Service seeks to enforce that decision. And as they do so, they begin to challenge the tax exemption of places like Bob Jones University in wow. Greenville, South Carolina, but also other segregation academies. And guess who runs one of those segregation academies? It's called Lynchburg Christian Academy in Lynchburg, Virginia, founded in 1967 by Jerry Falwell. Jerry, the Reverend Jerry Falwell. The Reverend Dr. Jerry Falwell. Uh, of the moral majority. And that gets his attention. The IRS is coming after my tax exemption. And that, according to Paul Weirich, as well as dozens of other sources, that was the catalyst for the religious right. It was not Roe v. Wade. So it was a court decision, but it wasn't Roe v. Wade. It was Green v. Connolly. So it, with that information, that's kind of mind boggling because I have a, a lot of friends, uh, friends that I love and, and I respect and family members who vote uh, conservatively. I'll just say it that way. Yeah. For that one single issue, because that is the mandate, that is a requirement of of God that we uh, stand up for uh, human life, right? Mm -hmm. To protect and preserve human life. Um, but in reality, these people that are waving that flag, it, it appears, if I'm understanding the story correctly, are actually working against the interests of people who look like me, African Americans. They're working to maintain the segregation structure of America. Am I missing that? No, I think you're right. Uh, and and uh, again, as, as, as you know, as I argue in bad faith, I think we're looking at a we're looking at a movement that was born out of racism. There's no pretty way to say that. I, I mean, I in the past, I've tried to kind of sugarcoat that a little bit, but you know, the facts are the facts, a movement that was born out of racism. And the fact that the leaders of this movement have not repented of that, I think, mm -hmm. has led us, and again, we can go through the steps, but has led us eventually to, to Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think that's the, the, real, the real tragedy of, of the religious right. And you... you it kind of led me to where I wanted to go, which is uh, we know the history of of the religious right, the true history, and I thank you for uh, revealing this. And for those of you who are listening to this conversation, I strongly encourage you to to get a copy of Bad Faith, which is widely available at, at most um, outlets where books are sold. Um, it's a quick read. It's 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 a light read, but it's chalked with dynamite. And this kind of dynamite that we're talking about right now, is is addressed in in this book. Now, the question that came to my mind uh, as I was reading this book is: was is this? Are we talking about a past phenomena, or are we talking about a present issue within well, the, yeah. within Christian evangelicalism? Well, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm not a numbers guy, <laughs> right. but uh, when I learned that 81% of white evangelicals voted for Donald Trump in 2016, and probably a greater percentage in 2020, you know, I have to take that for what it is. And you know, I, I, I suppose that somebody could make an argument that Donald Trump is not a racist. I, I'm, I'd be interested in hearing that argument, frankly, but I think the evidence is it probably points in the other direction. You know, with, beginning with the whole birther nonsense with Barack Obama and 
uh, comments about immigrants and black jobs and all that sort of thing. But I, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not going to try to put my finger on the scale. I think people should make their own judgments and determinations about that. But I think, yes, that I think there is a, there is a line that connects the origins of the religious right in the 1970s in defense of racial segregation to Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And that, and that line, frankly, uh, goes through Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll wait for your prompting. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so uh, a, can I, and I can say this and you don't have to agree with me, a racist line. I, I, I think the evidence is pretty clear. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's let's move forward into this conversation because what's important is for those that are listening not to agree with you or me, but yeah. to do their independent uh, inquiry. I think that's what's important for people to think for themselves. Sure. Because what I'm hearing um, and what I've read and come to understand based upon your, your, your book is that what Paul Ryrick, and, and political operators like him had in mind was a finding a way to bundle a group of people and, and exploiting them for political purposes. Yeah. And 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 the, the people who are being exploited are not just black evangelicals. I think that there are people uh, who are white, who are, who are Latino, who are Asian, who have a genuine belief in in in, in Christ and who are trying to honor God in their political expressions, but who are being misguided in terms of what the true motive of the movement is. Yeah, I, I, I believe that's right. Yes. But I, I but I also agree with you that uh, I think people make to need to make their own judgments on that. And, yeah. and, and, and you know, and and, and looking inside themselves <laughs> and, you know, what are my, my real motivations here and, and, and what are the values that that I'm supporting by voting a certain way, you know, either, either candidate or, you know, right. whatever right. candidate, I think we yeah. all need to I, do that as citizens and, and as Christians. I said in short, shortcut or shorthand fashion in, in my church, God is not a Democrat or a Republican. That's right. Um, <clears throat> I think we have to think about some of the, the words of the prophet Isaiah, his ways are not our ways. Yep. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And if we could, if we can define God and reduce him to a few talking points, then what kind of God is that? Who yeah. is this God? Yeah. I don't want to serve him, by the way. Yeah. But of course we can't, because what we really are dealing with is the the, the manipulations of men like Paul Weirich. And I want to talk more about Jerry Falwell. Yeah. And I want to talk more about um, race. Yeah. Now, Jerry Falwell um, um, not only was animated by the fact that he had one of those segregated private academies. But Jerry Farwell was also motivated by his views about the civil rights movement. I oh, yeah. Is that sure. also correct? Yeah. No, he's, he, he, he called civil rights civil wrongs. <laughs> and, I, I, and to be fair, I, and I do want to be fair, uh, Jerry Farwell later repented of his racism. And... Uh, you know, and I have to, you know, I, I'm inclined to, to believe he was sincere about that. Uh, okay. I, I don't think it changed his well, <laughs> behavior very much, but uh, he, he said that he could repent of his races, but yeah, he, he, he made all sorts of, of, uh, nasty comments about the civil rights movement. And, um, and but in our religious tradition, we believe in redemption. We believe in, in, in absolutely transformation. Of course. I mean, that's the core yeah one of the core teachings, right? One of our core Absolutely. beliefs. Absolutely. However, what Jesus said, or what John the Baptist said when he was baptizing is bring forth fruits of repentance. Right, right. And so I, you know, I hear, you know, cause I, 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 I don't, I grew up in the church of God in Christ. And so mm -hmm. based upon your, your description of pre-millennialism versus post-millennialism, it's clear that my church tradition was pre-millennialism. Mm, okay. Okay. Because every Sunday we heard those words, the Lord is soon to return. He could come at any moment. Right. You better get right. If you die tonight and right. your soul is not right, are you going to go to heaven or hell? That's right. We lived that. In fact, as a matter of routine, every night before we went to bed, we quote unquote repented. Sure. That is to say we confessed, but we weren't, 
my now my broader understanding of what repentance is it's more than words right it's it it's is. it's deeds it's changing the trajectory it's that zacchaeus kind of repentance if you remember zacchaeus the, yeah the small right. guy right uh, jesus didn't put any demands on him but when he saw jesus when he actually saw jesus and i mean that uh literally and i mean that figuratively when we see jesus it makes us do an examination of ourselves right right and true repentance requires us to right the wrongs that we've created yep. and zacchaeus said if i've taken uh money that was not mine i'll pay it back double right. that's tangible Repentance in the courts, we call that restitution. In the political discourse of, of black and white conversations, we call that reparations, but we're not on that today. Right. But the <laughs> fact is, when you say Jerry Falwell repented, what did he do exactly? I'm not challenging his statement. Yeah, I'd, I'd be hard pressed to say that uh, it changed his, uh, his politics. Right. <laughs> did it change his trajectory? It may have. I, I don't. I, you know. I. I. I, 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 I don't. See, I don't see any evidence of that. I mean. I. I. I but you know. I, I'm. You know. Jesus also said, "Judge not, ye be not judged." And so I. Right. I'm. I'm I, I don't want to judge him. I'm, I'm going to speak like a lawyer here on that. On that statement. <laughs> okay. Very. Very often, when people are called to serve jury service, the judge will make an announcement. You're simply here to look at the facts. What happened when? The judge then says, I will be the judge of what happens. <laughs> so I'm not sitting in judgment of Jerry Falwell or Paul Wyrick or any of those people. But right. we do get to parse out what the facts, the historical right. objective facts are. And so what I'm saying is I, I heard that, that he repented. I read that in your book. But what, what came to my mind was, and, and how did that look? Did he go to the black churches? Did he then uh, try to build black schools or... What did he do tangibly to 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 fill in the hole metaphorically that he created? Did he? Yeah. What dirt did he put back in the hole? I think I think you raise a very good point, and yep. uh, I, I I I I'd be hard pressed mm -hmm. to say that he did anything. I mean, in your book, you talk about a sermon that Jerry Falwell preached uh, close to the time of Bloody Sunday. Yeah. Oh, yes, I, I, and this is. Um, well, this is his most famous sermon. It's called "Of Ministers and Marches," where he uh, he's, he's really criticizing uh, Martin Luther King, and it was the day of the march from Selma to Montgomery. That is not Bloody Sunday, which was two Sundays before, mm -hmm. but the day that they finally were able to launch the successful march from, to Montgomery, and uh, he. He criticized it. He said, uh, "He said ministers should be in the business of um, soul winning rather than social reform." Now, again, the reason that sermon is so famous is because Falwell, you know, utterly flipped when he on on that issue when he became part of uh, or when he organized Moral Majority, and that is again coming back to what I said earlier about my father. Uh, what Falwell was expressing in that famous sermon was premillennialism, right? Uh, we should be working on, on uh, individual regeneration rather than social reform. Mm. So, but, you know, again, getting back to your earlier comment about how, how one's behavior should right. be the, the you should, Here's another quote. <laughs> you shall know them by, you shall know, by you the, know a tree right, by, the by the fruit that it, right. it bears. Yeah. Right. I'm, I love to listen to uh, great conversations, debates, and, and, and reflections, but let's talk about the trajectory of your life. You know, because there's all have sinned, right? Yeah. And fallen sure. short of the glory of God. But what are you doing presently? And what have you been doing most recently? Right. Right. I think if, if we approach politics with that type of lens, we would probably make better decisions because yeah. the one thing that politicians are adroit at is telling you what you want to hear. Right. Uh, talking points. Right. So, yeah. uh, anyway, yeah. let me let me let's let's move try move toward uh, bringing this conversation to a close. I just want to talk about a few other individuals that uh, that are mentioned. Um, James Dobson. Who's that? Yeah. James Dobson was the founder of, of an organization called Focus on the Family. He was very popular uh, at uh, the height of his uh, influence. He was on radio. Uh, I remember the number correctly, about 
over 600 radio stations every day for half an hour with his program. And he became, uh, again, one of the, the leaders of the religious right, um, probably in terms of a long term influence, uh, he uh, started something called the Family Research Council, which is uh, was the political arm of Focus on the Family. And the he head of that to this day is a guy by the name of Tony Perkins from Louisiana, who has, um, as you probably know, some uh, kind of long standing entanglements with the Ku Klux Klan. So, yeah. Yeah. so, so wait a minute, you know, we're doing this six degrees of separation for Ke Kevin Bacon here, if you know that game. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, so, I, and I'm not trying to besmirch the reputation of James Dobbs. And what I'm trying to do is help people in my community and people who love Jesus, I'll say that because that's my community as well. Sure. Really lay it all on the table and see what's going on here. Yeah. So James Dobson, someone who I've read his books, I've listened to some of those 30-minute sure. programs, many of them, particularly yeah. in the eight, yeah. 1980s, yeah. Um, because I'm actually, I, I grew up in the 70s. So I, in the 80s, I was in my 20s. So I, I'm familiar with all of that. Yeah. Um, but to 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 know that he has or he had a strong connection between someone who had a strong connection with the Ku Klux Klan, quite frankly, is disturbing to me. Yeah, should be. <laughs> and I think it would be disturbing to a lot of uh, people of goodwill, not just black people. Just look, yeah. the, the, the deal is we are being manipulated. We being everyone who claims and who are in pursuit of what is right and what is just and what is fair uh, and who want to do what is, is the will of God. Now, when we talk about politics versus religion, and there should be a line of demarcation in terms of what ministers involve themselves with. I think about the fact that Jesus himself talked about the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, uh, he talked about the least of those among us. You know, I was yeah. naked. You yeah. didn't cover. You didn't clothe me. I was hungry. Welcome, uh, welcome the stranger. Yeah. So where does modern day evangelicalism fit into modern day republicanism and conservatism? Particularly now, let's move away from the issue of black, white, and just deal with the issue of immigration. How, yeah. how do, how, how as, as, and I'm going to put myself inside the house of, of evangelicalism, I'm, I'm in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. But how how well are we doing uh, in terms of what Christ uh, articulated and expected, and how and in terms of how what our policy is and what our approach is toward immigrant? Well, yeah, I, you know, it, I, immigration is a tough issue. I don't pretend otherwise. I, and nations have to, you know, be concerned about borders, and and I understand that, but. I agree. You know, the, we're talking about people who claim to take the Bible seriously, uh, even literally. And it's hard for me to believe that when Jesus said we need to welcome the stranger and treat the foreigner as one of our own, it's hard for me to believe that that statement has no relevance to immigration policy. <laughs> That's um, now I, again. I, I acknowledge it's it's, it's a complex issue, as do I. But but here's the thing that concerns me. And and again, you don't, you don't have to agree with me. No, I I always love to have a conversation about these things. Um. One thing it doesn't mean for sure, as we try to sort through this complexity, is that we get the right to hate. Right. That we need to that we can that we can house within ourselves as Christians vitriol and animus yeah. toward the others, right? right? And in fact, I think if we even go back beyond and before the incarnation of Christ, when Moses is giving the law, one of the things that is a command is not that we tolerate the stranger, but that we love yeah. the stranger. Yeah. Right. So can can we say at least what we're doing today in terms of uh, inside our house, and I'm speaking as inside the evangelical house, is something less than loving? Mm -hmm. it's, it's strange. 
it looks like it to me. <laughs> yeah, it does. Absolutely. And, you know, it's. So let's, and, let's quickly talk about how Jerry Falwell and Paul Weirich got together and what they were able to accomplish. And then lastly, you want to talk about Ronald Reagan. Sure. Uh, well, and there was a famous meeting that takes place in June of 1979 in the Holiday Inn in Lynchburg, Virginia. Lynchburg, of course, is, was Jerry Falwell's hometown. And uh, I, again, I've, I've, I've read through a lot of these archival materials and uh, Paul Weirich had already been talking about a moral majority of Americans and it was lowercase m moral majority. In other words, he wasn't, he hadn't capitalized those letters. And so uh, as during the course of that conversation in the Holiday Inn in Lynchburg, Paul Weirich just kind of mentioned that, you know, I talked about a more moral majority of Americans and, and uh, Falwell almost immediately uh, picked up on that phrase. And he said, that's what we'll call this movement. We'll call it moral majority. So that's how the name came into being. So it was very much a collusion, uh, a, a, a cooperation between Jerry Falwell and Paul Weirich uh, to the extent that Paul Weirich frequently appeared on Jerry Falwell's radio programs. And I've, I've read through a lot of those radio transcripts in the mm -hmm. archives at Liberty University, which of course is Jerry Falwell's uh, university in, in Virginia. And so the, the two of them worked very, very closely together. In to to, to what end? Well, the, the, to what end uh, immediately was the election of Ronald Reagan. And let's remember who Ronald Reagan was running against in 1980. Who was, he, was he running, running against? Against a Southern Baptist Sunday school teacher. Uh, and uh, Ronald, uh, Jerry Falwell and others, including Billy Graham, by the way, and, and we can talk about Graham also, uh, decided for uh, whatever reason. And to be honest, I'm still a little mystified by this why that would be, but they decided for whatever reason to dump Jimmy Carter and to embrace Ronald Reagan in, in 1980. Uh, now, as you probably know, I've written a biography of Jimmy Carter, so I'm, I'm quite um, uh, both familiar with him and frankly well disposed toward him. Uh, he was mm -hmm. a person of utter integrity. Uh, and we can have a long conversation about the effectiveness of his presidency. And I think it was more effective than He's usually given credit for, but uh, the fact that Jerry Falwell and others, other evangelicals, uh, dumped Jimmy Carter for Ronald Reagan in 1980, I think, is a pretty important. Was Ronald Reagan particularly religious? And, no. And was he an evangelical? Uh, you know, he was asked uh, at some point whether or not he was born again, which, of course, as you know, is kind of the uh, the, the ticket word. It's like your card, right? <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, and somebody had to explain what that meant to him. And at the end of that exchange, he said, well, yeah, I suppose I qualify. <laughs> you know? And as you know, those of us who are born again, I mean, there's not a whole lot of. That, that was a two Corinthian yeah. moment, right? I right. <laughs> yeah, two Corinthian, right. There's not a lot of ambivalence about that. Right, and, right, right. You, you know. And, and, you and Reagan, of course, rarely attended church. And so, I mean, that's, you know, mm -hmm. I, I well, understand that a lot of politicians are like that. But whereas Jimmy Carter, even while he was president uh, of the United States, taught Sunday school in, in the Washington Baptist Church, I believe, 11 times, maybe 14 times during his wow. presidency. <laughs> Amazing. Um <laughs> More about Ronald Reagan. Yeah. Why did he become the darling of the conservative movement? Talk to me a little bit about what you know and you talk about in your book about well, what his history was prior it, to becoming well, the president. Yeah, and and this is what I think is disturbing because a lot of people regard Reagan as almost a messianic figure. And uh, what became clear to me as I was writing Bad Faith is that there's a there's a there's a history there that needs to be articulated. Uh, Ronald Reagan got his start in politics in California in opposition to the Rumford Fair Housing Act, which sought to ensure people of color equal access to both rental housing and purchase of, of property. He was uh, an outspoken opponent of both the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Throughout his political campaigns, he frequently invoked the dog whistle of law and order 
He also invoked what he called welfare queens. These are mm -hmm. women of color who uh, ostensibly live lives of luxury off the public dole. He was never able to produce one of these <laughs> welfare queens, but he was sure they were they existed. Yeah. And as president, he decimated the Civil Rights Commission. Uh, he also was a stalwart supporter of the apartheid re regime in South Africa, even as that regime was crumbling beneath its own weight. And for me, the clinching moment occurred on August 3rd, 1980. And this was uh, the start of the general election campaign for the presidency. That is, Reagan had just won the Republican nomination for president. He, he chooses to inaugurate his general election campaign for the presidency in, of all places, and I still can't quite believe he did this, in all, of all places, the Neshoba County Fair in Philadelphia, Mississippi, the place where, as you know, 16 summers earlier, the local Ku Klux Klan, in collusion with the local sheriff's department, abducted tortured and murdered three civil rights workers during freedom summer and reagan was the master of symbolism but lest anyone miss his purpose at that moment before a wall white audience at the neshoba county fair he invoked the age-old segregationist george wallace battle cry I believe in states' rights. States' rights, yes, that's the... And for me, that... That's the sanitized version of segregation, keep black people, brown sure. people in their place, states' rights. And that goes right. back to the history of the struggle between uh, right. the Confederate, the former Confederate after the Civil War. Right. And when they were national... Nathan, Nathan Bedford Forrest, yeah, the, right. who organized the Ku Klux Klan, yeah. So just to be clear, and we're closing, and I'm, I'm going to give you the last word. Uh, you've been so generous with your time and very informative, and I'm sure that this uh, conversation will live on in history, okay. maybe <laughs> infamy. I don't know. <laughs> it will live on. I, I, I have a sense that this conversation is going to live on. Um, but No it, pressure here. No pressure. <laughs> right. But this, I'm going to hold your book up just um, uh I'm going to hold it up so that, that they can see it. This book, Bad Faith, is excellent. I strongly encourage uh, those who are listening to this conversation, go out, go out and get a copy immediately. Uh, and then share it and start conversations in your community because what's discussed in this book is relevant to where we are right now in America. It tells us that this myth about abortion really has essentially nothing to do with uh, why the far right did what it did, why it re-engaged, uh, and that this was all about race. And unfortunately, disturbingly, it appears still to be somewhat about race. Now, you can vote for whoever you want, but you really do need to make uh, what I'm a fan of and an advocate of is people making informed decisions. So, um, Professor, I, I'm giving you the last word, but I want to just ask one more question relative to Ronald Reagan, because as you say, in the Republican Party, he is a messianic figure, right? So when he went to Neshoba County, um, to Philadelphia, Mississippi, was that just a big mistake on the part of some low-level staffer, or was that intentional, and was that an overture? Well, it, there's been a good bit of debate about that among uh, the, the Reagan staffers, and uh, some of them claim, well, it was just kind of a, an accident, but it's hard for me to believe it's an accident. I mean, you, you think about the overall strategy of the campaign in at America at the time. If I were launching my campaign for the presidency for the general election, I probably would have gone to California, which was, of course, was Reagan's home state. He had been governor of California. At that time, California was in play. It was not clear if it was going to go for Carter or for Reagan. So that would have been one place. Uh, maybe a Rust Belt city, Detroit or Cleveland or Buffalo or something like that, to call attention to economic distress there. Uh, 
you know, there were all sorts of places he could have done so, but he chose to open his campaign in Philadelphia, Mississippi. And, you know, I think strategically, uh, probably what the campaign was trying to do was to signal to, G to Jimmy Carter that they were not going to concede the South to Jimmy Carter. I suppose you could make that argument. But again, you could have made that point in Atlanta or, uh, or, or Charlotte or Orlando, your, your hometown, uh, and not go to the, 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 really the crucible of the civil rights movement in Philadelphia, Mississippi. So, you know, I, again, I, I don't have any way uh, uh, entree into Ronald Reagan's brain or his thinking at that time. Uh, but, uh, you know, clearly he was the candidate. So uh, ostensibly he signed off on it. Mm. Well, in, Professor, in one way or another. Professor Balmer, you have been excellent and um, informative and even enlightening in terms of what you've shared with us today. And and what you've shared in your book, again, let me um, commend to those who are and recommend to those who are uh, listening to this conversation, the book, Bad Faith, Professor Randall Balmer. You get the last word. What should we know? What should we be thinking about going forward? And, and I'm not talking about who we should vote for, but what should? how well, should we be looking at the world going forward? Well, you know, a, a couple of years ago, somebody asked me to write an essay on hope. And it, it got me thinking about hope. And, you know, as you know, at the end of 1 Corinthians 13, uh, St. Paul talks about uh, the three virtues or what have come to be called the three theological vir virtues, faith, hope, and love. Mm -hmm. And people talk about this all the time. And it occurred to me in the course of writing that essay that we talk about faith a good bit. We talk about love a great deal, especially at weddings and so forth. We read that passage from uh, 1 Corinthians. But we don't talk about much about hope. And it also occurred to me that hope is the only one of the theological virtues that is volitional. That is, we can choose to be hopeful. Now, we can't choose faith, really. I mean, faith is, I mean, and I believe this, faith is a gift of God. Uh, you know, we don't really choose love. You know, love is kind of uh, unpredictable. But we can choose to be hopeful. And I believe that we as Christians, we as believers need to be hopeful. I don't think we have a choice, especially those of us who are parents, right? I don't think a parent has the luxury of despair. And there are times when I look around these days, particularly at the political situation and, and say, um, especially over the last, you know, seven, eight years, and I look and say, boy, you know, things don't look uh, good. Things look pretty bleak right now. But I don't think we have the option of despair. We have to be hopeful. And I think Jesus calls us to be hopeful. So I would encourage anyone listening to this to embrace the theological virtue of, of hope. On that word, again, thank you. Um, and uh, on that note, we'll end and have a great day, Professor. And we certainly look forward to talking to you again real soon. I love that. Thank you. God bless. God bless you.